Good morning, everybody. So, so good to be here. And um, I don't know why, whenever I get up to preach, I feel nervous. I feel like I've done something wrong. <laughs> but um, it really is an absolute privilege. I'm from South Africa, like Winston said, a small little town called Empangani. And um, it is a privilege to be here. I feel overwhelmed by the privileged. I just want to see how these things work. I actually don't use it for my notes. It just helps my face to look like a face of an angel, the, the light. But um, I was just, while we were busy worshiping, Deb settled down. <laughs> while, we were, while we were busy worshiping, I'm overwhelmed because of a lot of reasons. And um, I want to talk this morning about transformation. A uh, good word is metamorphosis, or in, in French it'll be metamorphose. I don't know how you would pronounce that. But really it's just that process, and I just absolutely love the way that um, Brad has actually set me up for what we're preaching. We've been speaking about the glory of God, and if you see the picture behind me, the end goal is the, the butterfly, and the start will be us before we came to Jesus as worms. I mean, that's how we started off. We don't reflect anything of the glory of God when we're born, but as we get saved, that's the picture we want to see. And I want to say this, the final picture is when Jesus returns, and then we will be just like him. And so until Jesus returns, we will never reach the place where we reflect the glory completely. But our responsibility is to be transformed into the likeness of his son. And just a quick story. So, so Sins and I, my wife, we moved to a little town called Richards Bay 22 years ago. And in that time, I went and we weren't, we weren't serving God at all at that stage. My wife was quite a distraction on my path to recovery. But while, while we were trying to change our lives, get some sort of normality in, we decided to start over, start a business, I went and visited a friend of mine that I knew, I hadn't seen her for 10 years since, and we used to hang together when we used to go on a holiday in that area. And the first thing when I saw her, she was at my cousin's house, and I said to her, I said, Natalie, her name is Natalie Hayward. You won't, you won't know her. Some people might remember her. And I said, Natalie, there's something different about you. I could see physically that something had changed. And I've, I've come to realize a little bit later that there's a couple of scriptures in the Bible that actually talks about that. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And then it says in Ecclesiastes, wisdom brightens a man's face and takes away its hard appearance. I use my iPad, but wisdom can brighten a man's face and take away its hard appearance. And that's what I saw in Natalie. And I just said to her, I said, you know what, Natalie, Sins and I want to get married. We want to, we want to get our life sorted out. And she says, well, why don't you join me at church on Sunday? I, I lead the church that Natalie invited me to. And I'm thinking, we all, wanna, we all wanna have these moments of, this is who I wanna be. No, actually, we just wanna be Natalie Haywards. <laughs> Those men and women that are faithfully in love with Jesus, reflecting, reflecting his glory, and actually inviting people into the presence of that. And then a couple of years later, I don't know what Alex and Michelle were thinking, but they said when they saw us for the first time, they, they knew God said, this is the couple that's gonna take over the church from us. And I wanna just take this opportunity to say, Alex and Michelle, <laughs> What a privilege, man. This couple opened a door for us just to take over from them. And, and honestly, I mean, when people say, how's the church doing? I say, on average, we're doing well. Because if you lead a church, you'll know there's a lot of ups and there's a lot of downs. But on average, we're doing well. But I want to just take this opportunity to say, bro, thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Alex. We want to honor you, man. <laughs> Opening a door for us. <laughs> Natalie, Alex pointed us to Jesus. And um, so a couple of things that I, I want to I sort of just remind ourselves of as, as leaders, and I want to say this potential leaders, God is wanting to do something in and through us. So that is, that's, that's obvious. But I think the days of just doing church are over. We, we got to be able to actually be the church that Jesus is building and do the things that Jesus has called us to do. And part of that is actually hanging with unsaved people. And so I, I, I must be honest, I spend more of my social time hanging with unsaved people than what I do with saved people. And so the, one of the things I enjoy doing is I enjoy playing golf as much as I can, but that's just because I've got a wife, three daughters, I've got Cindy's mother staying with us, and her sister. So I'm a little bit outnumbered, so my little escape is playing golf as often as I can. And um, it, it's, been, it's been refreshing for me to hang with unsaved people, and I, mean, I even battled to, to, to refer to them as that, because we were all there at one stage, but I just realized that we, we are in a lost world, 
And what we're wanting to do is say, God, help us to reflect some of your glory so that man, the people that we call to reach, will see something different in us that will draw them into the presence of God. And I want to say this, it can be refreshing hanging with unsaved people. My wife's asked me not to use too many golf analogies, but it's, it's what, I, what I do for fun, and that helps me in my preaching as well. And my heart's desire is for us in the local church to find that sweet spot. And so if you're a golfer, you'll know that you, there's m- many ways of hitting a ball, but there's only one place to hit the ball where it just feels right. It's in the center of the club, and they actually call it the sweet spot. The ball seems to go as far as you want it to go, in the direction you want it to go, and it just feels good. And so I'm trusting that this week will be something of that, that we will find that sweet spot of what Jesus wants to do in and through you as, I can't slow down, I've only got 25 minutes. Okay. Well, I'll, Fred, I'm going to slow down, bro. I'll push it to 35 minutes then. In actual fact, take this as I want to spend 10 minutes with all of you lunch at lunchtime, and, but I'm going to spend it with you here. <laughs> just reduce your lunchtime. I've just wasted another minute there. So I want to, I want to encourage us. This, is, this to me is not a leadership thing anymore. This to me is there's a, there's a role that we as leaders play, and the book of Ephesians says our role is to see the church being strengthened and encouraged and built up until we all reach unity in the faith. And the way we do that is we want to be able to minister God's Word that equips us to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus. You see, conformity and transformation are two different things. I I grew up in a church where it was about conforming. It was about religious activities. It was about traditions and ways of doing things, ways of dressing. Women had to to have their heads covered. It It was a very religious environment. The problem with conforming is as soon as you got the freedom not to conform, you go and do your own thing in any way. You see, transformation comes by revelation, and that's what lasts forever. And it's that revelation that transforms us into the image of Christ that God wants to use you and me to reflect something of His goodness in the communities that He's called us to reach. I want to say this, hang with unsafe people, but don't fall in the trap of becoming like them. Love them, accept them, and um, I, I've built such a good relationship with these guys. I mean, they, there's a lot of banter that happens on the golf course. I, I can remember standing on the tee box on the one, only day I can't play is on a Sunday, but I can remember on, on a Friday afternoon standing on the tee box about a tee off, and then one of the guys shouts, hey, the pastor is about a tee off, ah, and then the whole Everybody that's behind us, everybody stands on the balcony, and now you've got a whole audience watching you, and I just said, Jesus, just this one time. I didn't get a hole in one, but I I landed about a half a meter away from the pin, and my response was just, you can have this outside help if you just join me tomorrow in church on Sunday. (laughs) I've had moments where I've hit, literally hit my ball out of bounds, where it's hit the curbstone and bounced back in and landed on the fairway. I've hit trees outside of the golf course. It's ricocheted and ended up back on the golf course. It's become a known thing. Mark has got outside help. It's unfair whenever he wins a competition. And so, but this is the relationship I have with him. But I just felt like in that relationship, there's got to be something different about me. And if I'm, if I'm honest with you, it's a very, very thin line. Uh, there, there's a line that, that Jesus doesn't want us to cross because that's when we stop reflecting his glory. And I think just the way that I've been brought up with my rebellious nature, uh, I like to get my toes as close to that line as possible. And I'm trusting that Jesus will help me just to actually not even, not even go there. But um, I, I want to share something. And if there's if there's nothing you take out of this morning's message, then just take whatever Brad shared. But I want to I want to look at the book of, of of Daniel. And before we go to the book of Daniel, Brad's spoken about these things. We have got the privilege of being part of an apostolic team. We got the privilege of ministering. But somebody said this once: the greatest gift in the church are not the four, uh, the fivefold gifts that you find in the book of Ephesians. The greatest gift in the church is actually those faithful men and women that come to church every single Sunday that allow our gifts to actually operate. Without people, we have got nothing to do. And God has called us to minister to one another. I think of the book of 
of Hebrews chapter 12. It's a, there's always stuff that hinders us and sin that we need to get rid of. And the book of Hebrews says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off the things that hinder and the sin that's so in, easy entangled so that we can run the race marked out for us. I want to say this, every single one of us has got a race to run. You're not going to find your name in the Bible, but you can become that cloud of witnesses for those coming after us. Natalie invited me to church. She paved something of the way for me to get back into the body of Christ. Alex and Michelle opened a door for us. It paved the way for sins and I to walk into something of our inheritance. It's not just a leadership thing. It's a normal Christian thing. Got to get back to the place where we understand that God has called us to lead, influence, and impact society. I love the, the book of Romans. It says, in view of God's mercy, I always, always like that. When, when, when Paul tries to encourage us, we don't want to be encouraged by what we do. It says, in view of God's mercy, in view of what Jesus has done. And so for me, my view needs to be Jesus. And when my view stays Jesus... My backdrop becomes Jesus. So when people see me, they see Jesus. That's the whole picture. If my, if my view is my ministry, then people see me. Then I've created a platform to perform from rather than a platform to minister from. And so as we're talking, as Paul speaks, almost get the picture that as we focus on Jesus, he actually sets the background for you and I. And that's the view we want to operate from. It's like having a play and you've got a whole bunch of actors and actresses on stage. What they would normally do is they would, they would create a backdrop. So even before the play begins, you already know where the story is going. Now I want to encourage us. Let's focus on Jesus and let him become the backdrop for you and I. And then it goes on to say, Paul wants to encourage them. He talks in Romans chapter 12 about the gifts he says, offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. God is wanting to do something with us as human beings. He wants to use us just as we are to reflect something of his glory. And then he says something which actually I, I share often when I get an opportunity to preach in churches. I, I like this thing that Paul says. He says, I want to say this to every one of you. Don't think more highly of yourself than what you ought there's nothing special about us, but there's spe something special about this king that we serve. And when we can allow ourselves to humble ourselves before the throne of God, our humility becomes our greatest strength, and Jesus gets glorified in and through what he's called us to do. So I want to I wanna help us understand that there's a role that we play as we obey Jesus that paves the way for those coming after us. Hebrews 12, since you are surrounded, let's become part of the clouds of witnesses. But I want to look at two passages of Scripture, and forgive me, the La Cite people, you might hear this twice, but there's a passage of Scripture in Daniel chapter 1. And so we, we understand that you've got Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They've been taken out of their natural environment. It's almost like they're taken out of the place where God wants them to be, and that was because of their own wrongdoing. But these men get captured and get put in a place in Babylon where everything to them is foreign. Yeah. The first thing they do is they change their names. They give them Babylonian names. The second thing they want to do, and I think these four boys were like, I'm okay if you want to change my name. You can call me what you want. I know who I am. And so for them, not a big deal. The next thing that they were asked to do was something that affected their faith. They were assigned a, a, a diet that they were to follow. And as this diet was presented to them, they were like, there's stuff in this food that, that we're not allowed to eat. Not because we're religious about it, but because of our relationship with God. He's, he's not, he hasn't permitted us to eat some of this food. And so what do they do? Oh, our hearts are in the right place. Jesus, no, no, actually, the, the Bible says they resolved not to defile their bodies by partaking of that food. And that decision that they made, it's like the, the convictions of their names determine their actions. They, you can change, change my name, but the conviction of who I am, the conviction of who I represent needs to determine our actions. And what does your name represent? We are sons and daughters of the living God. People can say what they want about us, but there's certain things that we need to resolve not to do because the conviction of who we are and who we represent 
needs to start guiding our actions. And as we make that step of faith, that's where God comes in. Because you know how the story goes? The, the guy says, oh, you can't eat your own food. They said, just give us vegetables and fruit to eat for the next 10 days. I'm going to get into trouble. Those days, that made them look better. These days, it makes you look... <laughs> let, let me not go there. Anyway, so for 10 days, all they ate was fruit and vegetables. And this is the confidence they had. They said to the guy, said, I can't change the diet. What happens if after 10 days you look terrible and then the, then the king's going to have my head because of the decision that you've asked me to make? No, no. And, and this is what they said. Test us in this. They were confident in their relationship with God and they would experience God's grace. And so God, because of their step of faith, worked in the heart of the chef and allowed them secretly to have a different diet. And after 10 days... Their appearance was 10 times better than those that were eating the other food that they resolved not to eat of. He has the picture for us. The conviction of their names determined their actions, and they impacted and influenced society. Because the next thing that happened is that chef said, from now onwards, everybody else will eat the diet that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel are eating. You see, our response... A conviction of our names, determine our actions, can be used to change society. And so this is not a leadership thing. This is a Christian thing. There's something about our behavior that needs to reflect something of the glory of God. And if we don't know how to change, then find yourself at the foot of Jesus. And say, God, let these things become a revelation to me so that I can be transformed into the likeness and image of Jesus. Because that's the, that's the whole point of being a Christian, is to reflect something of the glory of God. And so now we move to chapter 3 in the book of Daniel. And I like this passage of Scripture for a couple of reasons. The first couple of verses, to me, is actually a warped picture of what the church should actually be like. And so King Nebuchadnezzar sets up the statue of gold. And he, and he says, we're going to have a dedication ceremony and he summons everybody to come to the dedication of the statue of gold that he has set up. And then what he wants to do, he says, and then this is what we're going to do. So he wants people to conform to represent something of their worldly kingdom empire. And so he says, I've, I've set the statue up. I'm gonna, we're all going to assemble. And we're going to have worship playing. We're going to have all the instruments. And when you hear the instruments playing, this is what you are commanded to do. You see, for us in the church, it's different. You see, we don't, we're not building a statue. We, we're lifting up Jesus. We also assemble. <laughs> but, but we bow down out of revelation because we've been transformed and we're not trying to conform. But Nebuchadnezzar says, you will bow down and worship. And the, the response is, if you don't conform, you'll be chucked into the fiery furnace. There's a picture there for me of the church. Jesus, we worship him, we bow before his throne, but those who don't will also face a fiery furnace. And so you and I need to see this picture and almost try and respond in the same way that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego responded. Not too sure where Daniel was at that moment. So if you're a theologian that has figured that out, I'm not sure, but he's not mentioned. But I like the fact that chapter 1, Daniel paved the way, and his friends benefited. Now his friends are in a situation, either, and they must have thought, we've got this. We've seen God's favor in chapter one. It's our moment now to experience God's favor in chapter three. Let your chapter one moments, let us be the chapter one generation, setting up the chapter three generations, those coming after us. And they don't look to us, they look to our faithfulness, our, our, I love reading through the book of Hebrews. You, there's, there's all these names mentioned, but then there's this last little section. He says, I don't have time to tell you about this guy and this lady. And, the, and then it says, there were men and women that were sawn in two. I'm like, picture this. Those are the heroes of the faith. Not the ones that stood up and preached powerful messages. No, those that actually died for their faith. It said some went around in goatskins and sheepskins, and the context of that was, I think it was King Nero, or the, the Emperor Nero, used to, used to sew 
animal clothing to Christians and then set them off in the arenas. And they used to have lions and stuff hunting down these animals, but they weren't animals. They were Christians dressed in sheepskins and goatskins. I mean, how horrific. My friends, those are the heroes of the faith. Who are we looking to? We're looking to people that have actually died for the sake of the gospel, and we are motivated by them. I think this generation needs to be doing a little bit more to motivate the generation coming after us because things don't look too good. And what they need is faithful men and women that are going before them and paving the way. You and I get to sit here this week and say, Jesus, transform us into the image of your likeness. Pave the way, help us to pave the way for those that you've called us to lead that are coming after us. And so the story goes, worship starts, everybody bows down, except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then some of the astrologers go to the king and say, king, there's a couple of guys over here that pay no attention to you. They don't, they don't worship you, nor do they bow down to the gods that you set up. Their names are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so Nebuchadnezzar's attitude towards them changes and from them working for King Nebuchadnezzar, his attitude sort of like changes towards them. And I want to say this. It's okay. When you take a stand for you, what you believe in and the attitude of the people around you change, there is a good picture coming at the end. So Nebuchadnezzar comes to these three men. He says, apparently you pay no attention to what I have commanded, but I'm going to give you a second chance. We're going to do this again. I'm going to give you another chance. We're going to get the music to play again. And when that happens, you are commanded to bow down. And, um, and if you don't, he says, I'm going to throw you guys into the fiery furnace. And this is the part that I like. He says, then what God is going to be able to save you from my hands? You know what the answer was? Actually, we don't need to defend ourselves in this matter. This is the thing. The first point was Daniel chapter 1. Let the conviction of our names determine our actions. The second thing, the two points in Daniel chapter 3, the first thing they say to him is, when he, said, when he challenged him, which God will be able to save you? And it says, the God that we worship is able to save us. And so we need to understand that we serve a God that is able. And then straight afterwards, he says, but even if he doesn't, I want you to know, King Nebuchadnezzar, that we still won't bow down and worship the image that you've put up. So they understood our God is able, but they also understood is our God is sovereign. Take this cup away from me, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus obeyed. And because of his, his obedience, he was glorified. So the music starts playing. These three men keep standing. They take the soldiers, come rushing. They grab these three men. They tie them together, chuck them in the fiery furnace. The, the Bible says that the, the fire was so hot that the, the, the soldiers that were carrying them to the furnace actually died from the heat, and these three men fell in there. And as they fell into the fire, one of my favorite songs that we sing back home is, There's Another in the Fire. <laughs> I want us to understand this. Talk about courage. His name is Jesus. And as they went into, our oh God is able to save us. I don't want to get distracted now, but you know that they could have, in a sense, when they had a second chance, they could have said, Jesus, you know our hearts. <laughs> you know that we are going to bow down now, but we're not going to worship this image of gold. We're actually going to worship you, Jesus, and they won't know anything. And they could have said, our hearts are in the right place, but God is like, I'm not worried about your heart being in the right place. I'm worried about your heart, not re your actions not reflecting what's in your heart. And so for us, this generation, come on, let it not just be about our hearts are in the right place. Let us, let us be God, what's in our hearts, let it be reflected in our actions. God, you're able, but you're sovereign. If you save us, well, then so be it. If you don't, in the end, it will go well with us. They get chucked into the fire. And the first thing that Nebuchadnezzar shouts, and every, caught the attention of everybody, he says, weren't there three men? I see a fourth man, and it looks like the son of the gods. He's not even sure what is going on. And then he calls them. He says, come out. And this is the part that I love. As they come out of the fire, 
It says here in chapter 3, verses 27, crowd, the crowds were around him. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was their hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was not even a smell of fire on them. You see, we serve a God that when we walk in obedience, in faithfulness, he doesn't humiliate us when we come out. I think of that thing when... when when, when Jesus parted the seas. I mean, you imagine that moment where the Israelites are going to the promised land and all of a sudden they reach this raging sea. They don't quite know what to do. And it's the small little finer details that we forget about. When they were wandering in the desert and they were grumbling and complaining, God had to remind them, have you realized that for 40 years the soles of your shoes have been worn out and your clothes have been worn out? We need to look to the little details of what God is doing in and through us, and that will help us to be more grateful and thankful for what God is doing. It said when he parted the seas, it says the Israelites passed through on dry ground. I'm like, what, what, what's, what's so good about dry ground? The Israelites didn't come through the other side of the sea full of mud and disgust. You know what I'm saying? No, this is what God does. He paves the way for us to experience his goodness that's the evidence of his goodness that follows. And the guys are the same. They're in the fire. They get called out, and God says, not even a hair on your body or your hair on your head was singed. There's not even a hint of a smell of fire on you. Let the conviction of our name, sons and daughters of the living God, guide our actions. Let's understand that our God is able, but that our God is sovereign. If they didn't let their actions represent they, what their names represent, and if they said our hearts are in the good place and they bowed down, this story would not have ended the way it did. As they came out, this is what Nebuchadnezzar says, and these are the moments that you and I should be living for. Their Nebuchadnezzar, it's, it's their actions, it's their faithfulness, it's their obedience, it's their response brought about this part of the scripture. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Keep on doing what you're doing, friend of Vanessa. So the, the Russians can echo, praise be to the God of Fred Vanessa. Chicago, praise be to the God of Stephen Davis. I think of Ray and Moira Oliver. Let Africa still rejoice. Praise be to the God of Moira and Ray. This is what we represent. This is Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than to serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. And as an added bonus, we don't live for a reward. We live for eternal reward. But it says the king promoted them in Babylon. You see, not only did God use them to bring honor and glory to his name, he actually gave them a promotion. And I want to close with this. I've gone five minutes over. I still got that extra five from lunchtime. There was, there was those moments. There was that moment that I absolutely love. I love these old Bible stories and all these Israelites are standing there and they were fighting the Philistines and they sent David. David, don't you want to go take lunch for your brothers? They're fighting against the Philistines. And D David rocks up there, little shepherd boy. He rocks up there and he's like, I thought you guys were fighting. He said, what's, what's going on here? These guys are just standing there. They're doing nothing. And then he hears this, this giant shouting these defiances against Israel. And then he hears Saul making these promises of this is what will happen for anybody who has got the courage to take out this giant. And David's like, I can do it. You know why he could do it? Because David said there were moments in his life when he was looking after the sheep. Uh, the Bible says that there was, a, there, was a, there was a lion that came to take one of the sheep, and he tore the lion apart. And he talks about another occasion. While nobody's watching, there was a bear that came to take what he was given responsibility over, and he killed the bear. I actually think it was the other way around, because it, I think he killed the bear first, because it says he, he killed the lion with his bare hands. It's, <laughs> sorry, I had to do that. <laughs> 
And so the, I, want, I want to say this. The point here is the, the battles fought behind the scene create the battles that we can perform in public that gives God the honor and the glory. And David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? I'll take him out. Why? Because I've seen the move. I've seen the power of God that operates through faithful, obedient servants. And he goes and he takes out Goliath. And the thing that I love about that picture, when he chops off the head of the giant, it says that when the, when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, it said they fled. And the very next line says, and the Israelite army surged forward. Can I encourage us today? With our focus on Jesus, let's face the giants that will allow the rest of those coming after us to surge forward. I don't want to say this is just about the next generation, but I want to say this. God is wanting to equip you and I. He's taken us from an ugly old little caterpillar, and He's busy transforming us into the beauty of what He's wanting to do, and that transformation comes through revelation. My prayer for us is, God, reveal yourself to us like never before, so that when we leave this place, we can meet with those that you are calling us to reach. But let our actions, let our, the convictions of who we are, who we represent, guide our actions, and let's understand that our God is able, but our God is sovereign, and in that, let his name be glorified. Amen. Thank you very much, Mark. Very encouraging message. When uh, Brad was uh, speaking, I, I had a, a, a thought came into my mind, and I wanted to share it with you guys. Um, the words that we have to remember, what God has spoken to us, and what God will speak to us, and in this time of light, in this time of, we are here together in the conference, and the Lord is speaking, and it's encouraging, and we need to take these words and be encouraged by those words. And what I felt was that God was saying, remember the words that I'm speaking to you in these times of light, so that when the dark times come, you can go through it. And Mark, the, what you mentioned about chapter one generation to set up for the chapter three generation, I think it's very important. And that's why we will hear um, one of our young people uh, who will speak right now, and that's Claire Forbes. For those who were at the Europe uh, Equip in September last year, or October last year, uh, Claire also spoke there, and she spoke on the task of our generations. A really, really good message. It's on, on the internet, so please look it up. And listen to that. Uh, Claire, share what God has put on your heart for us. Hi, guys. <laughs> it's so great to be here. Um, my name is Claire. I'm a nurse. I'm based in Munich. Please don't ask me where I'm from. There's no good answer for that. I'm a little South African, a little Mongolian, a little German, with a sprinkle of American and a sprinkle of um, British on top. So I'm from all over the place. Um, funny enough, actually, one of my classmates from Mongolia is here, which is a weird co coincidence, but a lot of fun. Um, as I said, I'm a nurse. I take care of people and children with congenital heart defects, and it's a lot of fun, but it's also very challenging. Yeah, so as I was praying for this time and as I was asking God um, to give me something for this, this time, I really felt, I really had on my heart um, the young people, the, the new leaders, the, the people who are still in the youth, the people who maybe not even sure what they're doing here, but they've come along for the ride. Um, yeah, I, I really had something on my heart for you, and I've titled my, my topic The Warrior, but I think it, what would be more appropriate is Becoming the Warrior, 
Also, if you're wondering why I chose um, a handheld mic, is because if I had to deal with, um, have, have to figure out what to do with two hands, I'm nervous enough. So <laughs> one hand is, is enough for me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so becoming a warrior, and I thought I'd just share about some of the things that God's been doing in my life as well, and um, part of my journey, and becoming a warrior, and I'm still, still definitely on that journey. So one of the key moments in my journey has, was a few years ago, I was in Dresden, and I was attending Bible school, and um, the lecturer was Dr. Dirk Müller, and he did his PhD on the military language that Paul used in the book of Philippians. If you ever get the chance to read his PhD, I would really, his thesis, I would really, really, really recommend it. So I thought I'd just summarize what he taught us, because at the end of, the end of his teaching, there was, a, there was a moment for me where I realized I'm completely, completely out of my depth. So just, um, yeah, <laughs> that's what he told me too. <laughs> the, just to summarize what he taught us, um, the city of Philippi was founded as a Roman military colony. And um, Paul wrote this letter about 100 years after the colony was founded. So he addressed them in a language that they would understand. These old generals, these old soldiers, in a language that they would understand. And the letter mimics the structure used by Roman generals in their speeches to their troops. So the objective of war, the confidence of victory, and the wards for the courage and obedience. So the major unified theme of Philippines is a mutual military partnership for the advance of the gospel in a hostile context. So here's one of the examples. Um, I think we know it well. First Philippines 27 verse to 30. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come, to, come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. For this is a clear sign of them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you for that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that, I saw, that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So this kind of military language would have been very familiar to the people back then. Because one of the major strategies of the Roman soldiers was, I think we've all seen it, the, the turtle formation, where they would stand shoulder to shoulder, so close to each other that they could feel each other's heartbeat, that they could hear each other's breath. And they would advance, and then the, another verse is Philippians 3, verse 13, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of Christ in Jesus Christ. So with this military formation, they would go slowly but surely, and they would gain ground for their, for their, um, yeah, for their, for their, for their general. And this is the kind of picture, this is the kind of image that was Paul was, was talking about and what he was calling the people in Philippi to, to, um, to re repeat and to use also in, for the gospel. So Dirk summarized his whole thesis by saying victory is guaranteed because of our supreme general. And this is where it got to me. Victory means either the reception of the gospel by unbelievers or the death of the messenger on account of rejection of and opposition to the gospel. And our ultimate reward is fellowship with Christ in heaven. And he encourages us to take risks and to be unafraid of suffering and of sacrifice. Now, this was great. This is encouraging, right? But at that time... Instead of feeling like this great Roman warrior, I felt like um, the hobbits. I felt like I was thrust into a war, thrust into a task that I was not equipped to do, that I had no idea how to do, um, that I was too small, too young, too um, comfortable in my environment. Um, but, and I knew that that something in my life had to change. Actually, I went to, to Dirk and I said, hey, Dirk, thank you so much, but this is how I'm feeling. And he says, that's great, Claire, that was my point, because you cannot do this on your own. And, I'm, <laughs> and so um, I just had, so it, it really brought me to a place where I thought, okay, Jesus, you knew, you're going to have to help me get to the place where I 
can, um, where I can be part of what he's called us to do, be to, to be one of the people standing side by side with others. So I went into the Word, and I, and I found a few, there's many examples, but I've chosen three that have helped me, of people that um, either were warriors or had the heart of a warrior. Um, the first person that I have is Mary. Now, you're probably thinking Mary never ha held a sword, but I would also argue none of us will hold a literal sword, but you never know in this day and age. Um, but the way she responded to her commander is she had that heart of someone who says, yes, and I will step into it. And despite her fear and uncertainty, she submitted to the will of her king. So in first, uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 29 to 35, it says, And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favor one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what kind of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And Mary, in a little verses later, it says, Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be, let it be to me according to your word. And I think I, I, love, I love this story because it packs so much into it. And I think we forget about what the context. We all look at Mary and we think, wow, what an what amazing woman. She is blessed. She carried the Son of God. But I think we forget about what, it, what the consequences of her being pregnant and um, unmarried in that context would have been. And I think if we think about it, um, if we were in that position, I think a lot of us say, yeah, I don't know if I could do what Mary did. And that's the, reaction, that's the reality of sometimes the world we live in too, that we're, afraid of, we're sometimes afraid of what God will call us to, or we're afraid of what he's going to ask us to do. Um, C.S. Lewis said, um, we are not necessarily doubting that God will do the best for us. We are wondering how painful the pain best will turn out to be. And I think we live in a society, just as Mary did, of shame and rejection and of fear. You post something and the whole world feels like they can have an opinion on your, your thing. Um, you, have, you take a stand for something and the whole world feels like they can shame you. We live in also in a cancel culture and it's awful, but it's something that we're going to have to learn to face. Because... Um, yeah, because just like Mary, we are, we'll be called to, take, to be, do, do things that will bring us into a place that might, um, yeah, that make, might make us feel those, the same things that Mary would have felt. And what I also love about Mary, she, just like maybe a soldier would have asked the general, hey, how, I see your goal, but how are we going to get there? The logistics, what about the logistics of the battle? She asks. And I think that's also okay, that when we, God gives us a task, that we ask, hey, how is this going to be possible? But God is so good. One, he addressed her fear and says, do not be afraid, because he's the one who takes away our fear. And he provided a supernatural strategy to her concern. And that's just the thing, is that it's not about us, it's not about our strength, but it's about our supreme general, and that all that he does, he works his will through us, and that in the end, um, there will be no doubt that he's the one, and the one who's, uh, who accomplished that, and it's only that all the glory belongs to him. And in the end, Mary, af after she's pregnant, she's with her cousin Elizabeth, and this is what I hope that my response can and will be. And she magnifies the Lord and says, My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he looked upon the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Now, the second example I have is Gideon. Now, Gideon is not the ex best example of how we should respond. If you look, want to look for someone who has a better response, check up Isaiah or any of the disciples, but not Gideon. But what I love about Gideon is he's so awfully relatable, <laughs> and he's so, such a great comfort to me. And the, we, our first ex encounter with him is in Judges chapter 6. I'll just read from verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebith, terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite. 
while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wide press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Now, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with how you um, beat out wheat, but the, the objective is to get rid of the chaff. And to do that, you need to be in open ground so that the wind can blow away the chaff. So I think the, a lot of us, if we had encountered someone like Gideon, who's doing something not courageous, something a little, can I say stupid, um, not logical, um, a lot of us would see people like that and think, yeah, yeah I'm not sure if God's, that's the one God's calling. <laughs> I'm not sure if he's the one we should be using. And he's not the great, he doesn't make the great, greatest impression, first impression. But this is what's amazing about God. He prophesied over him and says, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And I think, um, and then Gideon also says, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Now, how often has this happened to us? That we've been in a meeting like this or a church and someone prophesies over us and they kind of and you think in your heart, but if they knew what was going in my life, they knew the silly decisions I've been making, if they knew that I do not have my life altogether, they wouldn't be saying this. And how often do we doubt God's voice, God speaking into our lives because we feel unqualified, because we feel like the weakest and because we feel like the least? How often are we quicker to disqualify ourselves? But this is yeah. Eventually, he, 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 he's, there's a whole discussion with the angel, and first he doesn't even believe it's the Lord. And like I said, he's not the, the ideal example of, of <laughs> a great response. In the end, he, has, he, he acknowledges that it is the, the voice of the Lord, and he's, been, he's given his first task. And his first task, you find in Judges 6, um, 25 to 27, that night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold here, with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of Asherah that you, that you shall cut down. So good, Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But he, because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. And again, he, he does what God's called him to do, but he does it by night because he's still struggling with this fear and fear of his own family. And I think that's something that we can also relate to, that we felt the call of God. We know it's him. We've had confirmation. But there's still this, this fear of what people are going to think about us. What people, and here he's called, down, he's called to cut down a religion, he's called to cut down a belief system, and that is terrifying stuff. And I think if we in our society are faced with something similar, I think a lot of us can relate to that fear. Um, but he is obedient, and he does do it. And in the end, his family, who he's the most afraid of, actually defend him, which is incredible. So he's, he's, he's succeeded in his first task, and he was victorious, and his family defends him, and he he's, has this moment of courage, and um, it says in the end of chapter 6, but the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpet, and, and the Abizurites were called out to follow him, and he sent messengers out throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they went up to meet him. So now he, he's, he's, he's full of the Holy Spirit. He's had this moment of victory. He's fooling, feeling full of courage. And he summons everyone to fight against the enemy. And then the next chapter, he's filled with extreme, extreme doubt. Extreme doubt again, this poor chap. So relatable. <laughs> um, <laughs> and... He even tests God twice, and he knows in the book of Deuteronomy, it's Deuteronomy it says, do not test the Lord your God. He says, do, he knows that he's, in, in a sense, it's a sin that he's testing God, but he is so filled with this doubt that he tests God twice, and God is gracious, and he, and he answers Gideon in his fear. Now, now, on top of his doubts, 
he has these 32,000 men, and because God is trying to do something in Gideon's life and in the lives of Israel, he wants, God wants to make sure that Israel knows and the whole world knows that it's through, it's because of God and not because of Gideon and not because of the men and because of who God is that they will achieve this victory. So on top of um, him having this task to defeat the enemy, he is told to reduce his 32,000 men to 300 men. Again, these crazy logistics, Mary falling pregnant without being married, um, for, uh, defeating an army with 300 men. And so those who were, the men who were afraid were allowed to go home, and all that drank water like a dog directly from water were allowed to go home. So from 32,000 men, which is, I would say, I would feel, I would feel ready and confident to, to go against an army, he was reduced to 300 men. Now, God doesn't stop there. You'd think, uh, I think a natural war strategy is to use swords and chariots and horses. But again, God gives him a supernatural strategy um, to not use swords, but to use trumpets, empty jars, and torches hidden in those jars. Um, I don't know about you guys, but at, at the point when God's telling me to use, to use trumpets, jars, and torches to, to fight an enemy, <laughs> I, would, I would be going back to that fleece. Um, <laughs> but this is the strategy that God gave him because, the, because it's not through our strength and it's not through Gideon, who Gideon is. It's, it's always, always about, been about our supreme general and about his victory. And so the story goes, we know the story. They um, sounded the trumpets, they broke those jars, and they surrounded them with the light. And because of the confusion and just the pure terror, they enemy turned on themselves and defeated and completely destroyed themselves. And that's just the thing. Maybe we can relate. Maybe we do feel doubt that we've heard correctly and we've been given these crazy dreams and these, these insane strategies. And maybe we also feel insecure. We feel like the weakest and the least. But the thing is that doesn't matter because God has already assured victory and he addresses our fears. And what about those creative solutions? Why should we continue doing things the way we've been doing it for the last 40 years? Why do we need to use swords when God has given us a strategy with um, jars and trumpets? And maybe he has given you a strategy for your church. And, it, and um, maybe, and it's okay. I think we might not get it 100% of, right 100% of the time, but we shouldn't stop trying. And also sometimes we might receive from our leaders a not yes or no, but that's also okay. That doesn't mean that we, we should stop trying. We shouldn't stop hearing from God and hearing what he wants to, wanting to do and through the church. So my final warrior is a different kind of warrior. It's, it's David, and we already talked a bit about David. And now David has, um, he's fought the lion, he's fought the bear, he spent years alone with God on those fields, and he knows the word of God. And I think a lot of us um, have experienced that as, as well. We've, we've also, we've spent the time, we've spent the, the energy, we've fought battles with him, we've led ministries, we've We've, um, um, we've been in ministry, in, we've been serving in some sort of way. And in 1 Samuel 16, uh, verse 18, it says about David, Behold, I have seen the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. And I think a lot of us feel like that as well. Like, hey, we've been doing this for a while. We're ready to go. And we've, we've had the anointing, if you, if you will, but the timing's just not right. And we see people around us stepping into the anointing. We see people around us succeeding in where we want to see. And, um, and David, and like David, he, instead of stepping into his anointing as king, he is made to run for his life and to fight a lot more frustrating small battles and he even, has, he even has the opportunity to take matters into his own hands and to kill Saul to, uh, twice in order to um, take hold of, of his rightful place as king. And I think a lot of us, we were stuck in this, where we feel like we're stuck in this moment where we're, we feel so ready. We're kind of like, come on, let me at it. Let me at it. But the timing is just not right. And I think we need to trust God and trust him in the process because 
if David had, um, we don't want even know, I don't even want to know what the consequences would have been if he had killed Saul ahead of time. God's anointed. And that's just the thing. Sometimes we need, we need to have that patience. Who else waited? Joseph waited. Paul waited. There's so many accounts of people having to wait. And I think there's a lot of us young leaders who are rearing to go, ready to go. And that's great. But sometimes the timing's just not right. And that doesn't mean it's, you're, you've heard wrong. It doesn't mean that um, you're not anointed. It just means the timing's not right yet. So these are three warriors who have been examples to me in different seasons. And here's the thing, whether we like it or not, there is an opponent, there are battles to be faced, and we could bury our heads in the sand and hope it will pass us by. But the truth is, no matter where we turn, we will be asked to stand for something. There are so many good causes to stand for. There are governments, politicians, opinions, but all these things will fail, they will disappoint us, and they will fade away. Or we could say yes to God and to a kingdom that cannot be shaken. For a king who has already been victorious and conquered death against an enemy whose days are numbered, he is a king that will take away our fear and who doesn't send us out alone. We are here surrounded by an amazing team with men and women who have fought battles ahead of us and equips us with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel, shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. So brothers and sisters in arms, let us stand firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side, shoulder to shoulder, for the faith of the gospel, and let us not be frightened in anything by our opponents. And may our battle cry be, Hail, Lion of Judah, the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Amen.